living on a lighted stage approaches the unreal for those who think and feel in touch with some reality beyond the gilded Would you please welcome from Canada, Ross. If you got a band together growing up, you didn't think about writing your own music. You learned other songs, and you kind of identified yourself by this kind of music you'd play. And all the best players I quickly learned, the, the language was Rush. <laughs> First time I heard Rush, I was like, oh my God, I had no idea this band was this this incredible. I became obsessed. They were my gods. I listened to it and I thought, wow, that is amazing playing. My mind was just totally blown. I bought every magazine, I had every record, I cut out every picture, and I would go to sleep at night with Rush on the heads, you know, wake up and it was still playing. Like, I did that. I, Sebastian Bach, was member number three of the Rush Backstage Club of Toronto, mother trucker. Rush is just one of those bands that has a deep reservoir of rocket sauce. A lot of bands, they've only got so much in the bottle. They use it up sometimes in one song. These guys were the real deal. Their bottle was so big and so filled to the brim, they, they were shaking it literally for decades. And still, there was sauce coming out. What makes Rush unique is fearlessness. It's the quality of starting to write a song and not caring about what's popular, what's not. There's only one band that sounds like that. What kind of band is Rush? It's Rush. I believe when people step back and actually really look at who the great bands were, they are one of those bands. But somehow they were never popular enough that they get commonly name-checked as one of the great bands of all time. A lot of the other stuff has been over-explained. Zeppelin has been over-explained. The Beatles have been over-explained. It doesn't tell the whole story. And you can say, why was this band marginalized? What was it? It doesn't matter. At some point, they're there. And somebody has to explain why they're there. <laughs> Approaches the unreal, for those who make and feel, in touch with 
guess we should start at the beginning. Talk about your upbringing, where you were born, and what your childhood was like. Okay, how do I start? Like my beginnings. I was born in Willowdale, Ontario. I was a nebbishy, quiet kid. My parents were both Holocaust survivors and emigrated here after the war. They basically arrived with 10 bucks in their pocket and they worked their way up to a lower middle class kind of income and raised me in the suburbs. When we first moved in, we were one of the few Jewish families to live in our neighborhood and we were constantly living in terror of being beat up because of that fact. So it was an exciting time. <laughs> when I was 12, my father passed away and I had to go to synagogue in the morning and in the evening every day for 11 months in one day. I was not really allowed to listen to music. So that whole year was devoid of what all the other kids were just starting to get turned on to. After the year, he really came out and he was himself. I said to get, mom wants to buy you a nice present. You were such a good, hardworking kid. He says, Mom, he says, next door, Terry has a guitar. As we drove into the drive, I says, he has $50. Go to Terry, get your guitar. And then Alex entered my life in junior high school. We liked the same kind of bands, but I think we bonded more over our goofiness than over music. <laughs> OK, thanks. That's my earliest memory of you yeah. was your Paisley shirt, a purple Paisley shirt. Yeah, it was purple. Yeah. <laughs> Burgundy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and I was born in Fernie in British Columbia. My parents came over after the war from Yugoslavia. We moved to Toronto, and I would say it was a very normal upbringing. My father usually had two or three jobs at any given time, and he believed that if you wanted something, you went out and you worked for it, period. This is when Alex was, you know, a youngster. And this is when he was a Navy League cadet. He was such a, such a cutie. <laughs> One day he came and he said, Mom, Dad, if I bring you a good report card, will you buy me a guitar? And, you know, he brought a very good report card and we promised and we didn't even have money. We just borrowed the money and bought him guitar. I would come home after school and play until dinner and then supposed to do my homework and just play guitar all the time. I couldn't stop playing. <laughs> this wasn't here. None of these houses. None, it's just the school and a field. Yeah. Oh my God. There's Fisher Bill there. I remember my homeroom class was the third window from the end. Alex was always a teacher's pet at school. He always smiled up to the teachers, and you know, he was a real schmoozer. We were in the same homeroom. I don't. Did we used to take all our classes together? In the grade nine, we did. The one year we rode each other's test. <laughs> we were almost finished the test, and we said at the end, "You sign my name, I'll sign yours." We were bad. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I do yeah. remember. That's how bad we were. Yeah. We upset the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> we were very similar. We both felt like we were really outside the rest of our class, the rest of our school, the rest of everything. And then we discovered this manic love for music that we both had. We got this gig early in September of 1968 in this church basement. John Rutsu was a neighbor that played drums. And I asked Ged if he would sit in, because he knew these same songs that we all knew. So I said, sure. I came down. We were playing this drop-in center in Willowdale called The Coffin. That, that's, that was the coffin there. He used to come in here and used to go downstairs. When we had maybe 35 people there, and we got paid $10 to do the show for the whole band, not each, 10 bucks. And we went to Panzer's Deli afterwards, and the three of us sat in a booth planning our takeover of the world. I started hanging around with Alex and John. We would come downtown, and there was a coffee shop in New Yorkville called The Upper Crust. A lot of the musicians would hang out there. There was another band that we really idolized at the time called The Poppers. You could see the guys from that band hanging around, so of course we would go in there and order a cup of tea like they were and try to be cool. And you know, we were just these little suburban hippies. Always playing with your hair, you know. You know, trying to look you know, like you fit in. I was living on Yorkville Avenue, and I had met the guys at a concert in the church hall. 
Even though they were 16-year-old kids, they were incredibly good players. You know, I was a fan immediately. They were playing the kind of music that I liked. Ray said, you guys need a manager, and what did we know? And we said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Get us up to 12 bucks from 10 bucks. <laughs> And Ray started booking dances and putting up posters on telephone poles, and we started to grow. In Ontario at the time, with a drinking age that high, the high schools took it upon themselves to create entertainment for teenagers. So there was a real circuit to do. That's really what bands did back then. You played at a school dance, and hopefully you had a repertoire that covered lots of the current popular music, but that wasn't really our thing. <laughs> We played a lot of Sadie Hawkins dances. We played a lot of dances where people couldn't dance very well because we weren't really a dance band. Everyone would be staying at the back of the hall. They wouldn't even be coming near us like we were contagious or something. We probably bummed out a lot of people on their high school memories. I, I was trying to do this full time and stay alive and the three of them were still in high school. They were pretty much a part-time band playing high schools on weekends and they were practicing at getting Aunt Alex's house. We were rehearsing in my basement and playing with these guys. They weren't Jewish guys. We were really loud, and it didn't sound anything like music to my family. They just thought I was nuts. They thought I was probably a drug-taking freak. So they were scared. They were freaked out. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to handle it. The whole neighborhood was just bumping because the music was so loud and everything was vibrating. I really didn't like it. It wasn't my kind of music, you know. Perry Como was my kind of music. <laughs> Alex's mom and I used to talk always on the front, cry at each other's shoulder. It was hard because he, he wanted to just play and practice and he couldn't study. He would go to sleep late, couldn't get up. And that's why he said, I'm quitting grade 12. And we were very upset. Like, I don't want to make a bunch of money. Like, if I make a lot of money, that's great. But I'm not going to go to university you, and get a big like degree. Hang on. No, I don't. I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to drive around in a big car and, see, and get people to go, <coughs> hey, there goes Alex. He's loaded with money. And wow, he's really set himself up great. But I don't see why I have to go through all the, the bullshit of high school to learn music. It's not that we're forcing Alex to go to university right now or anything. We're just asking a little favor of him just to finish grade 12. And then he's on his own. We wanted for him to be something, you know, to have education. I was a little bit worried about his future. If he doesn't finish high school, what's going to happen? And if the group doesn't succeed, you know? It was tough, you know? It was tough to go through that. You know, the thing is, my parents were right. I thought I knew everything. I have said to you, Alex, I want you to be free to expand. You know, they came from Yugoslavia. People were getting killed everywhere. My dad was in prison camps. You know, they came to Canada, and their kids are everything. That was, I'm sure, a great disappointment to them, that I wasn't going to do something that was more professional. So the whole idea of leaving school was a stressful decision, but, you know, at that age, I was just wanting to be a kid. And there was so much heaviness in my family's life, being Holocaust survivors, losing your dad at 12. I kind of wanted to run away from that a little bit. To my mother, it was the equivalent of joining the circus, really. She didn't see any music in what we were doing. This was just madness. And she didn't really get it until she one day, years later, saw me on television. And then it kind of, oh, oh, he's an entertainer, <laughs> you know. Now I understand what he's doing. Once again, we're back at the Laura Secord Secondary School. We've got a great trio of guys here that call themselves Rush, and I think we'll let John, the drummer, introduce the rest of the guys to you right now. Well, introducing on lead guitar and vocals, Alex Lifeson, and on lead vocals and bass guitar, Debbie Lee. And sitting behind the drums here, myself, John Rutsey. Okay, we're going to see in this number if we get you to make a little noise along with us. Doesn't take too much. All you got to do is put your hands together like this.
turning point came in 1971 when the drinking age was lowered to 18 from 21 in Ontario. As soon as the drinking age dropped, actually, to 18, it was right at the time we turned 18, so we could finally start playing in bars, which were better paying, more serious gigs. See, what happened is Yorkville got shut down by 1970. They wanted to rid that area of hippies and the clubs. As it shifted onto Young Street and down on Queen Street as well. And as soon as the drinking age went down in 71, it invited a whole different kind of music because a drinking crowd wants a different kind of entertainment than a listening crowd. You wanted something harder and heavier. So a whole new world grew. The scene in Toronto was vibrant as far as live bands go. There are a ton of live venues. I went into a place called the Abbey Road Pub, which was on Queen Street, and saw Rush one night. And I remember watching him going, wow, there's, there's something going on here. We went from playing a couple of high school dances in the course of a month to playing six nights a week with matinees on Saturdays sometimes, and playing four or five 40-minute sets. We started to get a little more experimental with music and that was great because that's really where we learned our chops I'm gonna do a number called garden road for you Initially, I was trying to get them a record deal, and no one was willing to sign them. I couldn't get arrested, so it became obvious that I was going to have to come up with the money and do the record myself. We looked for, geez, I guess about four months trying to get a record deal on Rush in this country and couldn't get anyone interested at all. There was just no reaction. We were willing to literally give the album away if somebody would just make a commitment to promote it. Couldn't get that. Part of the general attitude in Canada is Unfortunately, the people coming out to see you, not all of them, but quite a few of them go, well, they're a local band, how good can they be? And it's funny, you know, when other people from the States come out and they see these so-called local bands, they go, man, these guys are fantastic. There was no one in Canada to sign you. There were no record companies here. They were outposts, really. You, you had to get an American deal if you wanted to, to do anything. Cleveland rocks, Cleveland rocks. Cleveland rocks on WMMS. I was up in my office, and I was listening to the new music. We were deciding what we were going to play that week, and suddenly I get this thing from Canada. And I remember dropping the needle on what was the longest cut, because back in those days in album rock, you were always looking for what was called bathroom songs. And a bathroom song was something that if you did have to answer the call of nature, the record wouldn't run out. And then I start listening to the song, and I'm just, oh my god, this is a perfect record for Cleveland. Back then it was a factory town. The song Working Man, every listener in the audience felt like that. light up immediately. When's the new Led Zeppelin album out? No, no, not a new Led Zeppelin album. Canadian band, Rush. Every time the record gets played, people are calling. Where can we get one? Where can we get one? We had this cult following going already. June 1974, I was working at Mercury Records in Chicago. It was a Monday morning, and on my desk was an album. There's a note that comes along with it. It says here, this is the first album by a Canadian group called Rush, and that it's already selling in Cleveland, and they're looking for a deal in the United States. The artist and repertoire person who would normally listen was not in. So they took it to the, you know, the least qualified guy, me. I put on the record and got blown away. I said, get the president of the company on the line. <laughs> we should sign this band. He said, don't make a deal with anyone until we talk. <laughs> and uh, he loved the record, and he really wanted to sign us. By the end of the day, we had worked out a deal, signing the band like within eight hours of hearing it. We went from getting this offer to getting an advance to buying equipment. Everything was happening very, very quickly. I don't think that John 
really felt comfortable with what was happening. You know, we talked about musical differences, and he was a much more straight-ahead rock kind of guy. He was more into Bad Company, whereas Ged and I were more into Yes and Genesis and Pink Floyd and bands like that. You know, if we'd stayed on the Toronto local circuit, we probably would have stayed together, and that would have been fine. But it, suddenly things were turning a page. John was not a healthy boy. He had sugar diabetes. Of course, like any teenager, they like to drink and whatever else. He was not taking care of himself. And I took Getty and Alex aside and Ray, and I said, we have to replace John for his health. We can't put him out there on that tour, or we'll be bringing him home in a box. So I discussed it with John. Of course, he was heartbroken, but he understood. There was no saying that John wasn't doing his job. It wasn't for his ability to drum that he was let go. It was for health reasons. It's like coming to the end of high school, and you're with all your friends in high school, and you think, oh yeah, well, we'll know each other forever. And then everybody just goes in their own direction, and you know, for the most part, you never see those people again. It was a big deal. We had an American contract. We were going to go to the States. We only had less than a month to find somebody and get them in shape for us to go on the road. We needed a drummer. Let's put it like that. Broken drum head. I thought it would be good to start at the beginning. Oh, how, how predictable. The very beginning, where you were born, where you grew up. Much of that I don't remember. <laughs> I know, but I was uh, born on the, uh, we lived on the family farm near Hagesville, Ontario at the time and went to the nearest hospital, which was in Hamilton and moved to St. Catharines when I was about four or so. I had never been athletic. I never could play hockey. I skated on my ankles, which for a young Canadian kid, that's automatically like the hugest curse a young boy could have. Well, he was, in those days, I used to say weird. <laughs> he just read everything. He just read everything there was to read. He, he even had to learn to knit because he had to know how that was done. It was horrible coming into high school once I got interested in rock bands and all that and, and started to grow my hair a little over my ears and wear bell bottoms and all that stuff. The taunting in the hallways and even physical abuse out in the smoking area and the constant misfit sense for any kid, especially a sensitive one, just wears you down. So that's why drumming became an instrument of self-esteem for me. This was the first time I was admired for anything and that doubled my fervor about playing drums. <laughs> I was in a very serious band at the time called J.R. Flood. We practiced all weekdays and then weekends. We were playing high schools around Ontario or the Knights of Columbus Halls. summer of 74, I was working behind the parts counter for my dad, the farm equipment dealer, and this white Corvette pulled up. A white Corvette doesn't pull up in the farm equipment dealership that often. They came and asked if they could talk to Neil and take him out to lunch, and I could tell as Neil came back the rest of the afternoon that he was really troubled with something. He told me then that these guys were the managers of Rush, and they wanted Neil to come over and audition, and he said, I don't know what to do, Dad, and I said, well, Two things. First of all, we'll talk it over with your mother. But secondly, as far as I'm concerned, this is your passion. This is all you have wanted all your life. And I said, I guess there will always be a fire department here. So I think you've got to go for it. So I borrowed my mom's Pinto. <laughs> So perfect. And loaded my drums into that and drove up to Ajax. So the car pulls up with this kind of gangly guy with really kind of short hair. My first impression was that he kind of goofy. I remember thinking, God, he's not, he's not nearly cool enough to be in this band. I had Rogers with two 18-inch bass drums and everything set up really high and kind of weird looking. <laughs> and I was kind of weird looking. And then he started playing them and he pounded the crap out of those drums. I mean, he played like Keith Moon and John Bonham at the same time. And I was blown away. As soon as he started playing, he's playing these triplets and he was so good. I think it's very common for musicians, especially in your early years, to feel that you totally blew it. <laughs> and I had that feeling, I could have played better, I should have played better, all that stuff. But um, 
um, they picked me. Like a tornado came and hit my life and swept it away. We had two weeks to prepare and to learn songs that I'd never heard before and to gel a little bit as much as we could. The first show was going to be in front of 11,000 people at Pittsburgh Civic Arena opening for Manfred Mann and Uriah Heep. that the biggest rock audience was Midwest. And we gave Russia the perfect audience to come into. It was a great rock audience, you know, and they loved their rock music. We had a dressing room that was just a small kind of room under the stands at the far end of the arena, away from the other dressing rooms. We had this tour manager, Howard Underlider, who would come in from New York. And he was teaching us how to be professional. I remember Howard saying, well, you know, you can have booze or something, and they'll supply it for you. And we went, really? OK, cool. I ordered like a little bottle of Southern Comfort and I think Alex ordered Blue Nun wine or something like that. I remember taking a sip of this stuff and it went straight to my head and I was completely dizzy. <laughs> and we hit the stage. By the time I kind of came to my senses, the set was over and we were off and I had no idea how well we'd played. My, my immediate thoughts were, God, he can sing high, was my first thought. And how full it sounded, just a three-piece. And Rush came out and nailed it. It was obvious that they were gonna, you know, move up the ladder pretty quick. It was huge. And this was the start of our tour. And it was America. Big, bold, beautiful America. We were so excited to be doing it. Here are these three 20-year-old guys living a dream. I mean, it was a very exciting time. And we were working 11 days on, one day off, nine days on, one day off. I mean, we were really working a lot and traveling all over the place. The circuit was different back then. The money certainly wasn't as great. And you wanted to play five or six times a week. You could play markets like Johnson City, Tennessee, or Yakima, Washington. You would talk about how many shows in Iowa you were going to do. Every day, we would always share the driving, and everybody was sharing rooms. We had a room rotation schedule back then. It was kind of fun. Traveling around in a rental car. It wasn't even a bus or a van or anything. Sleeping on your baggage. Now, you know, you'd be in traction for a month if you did a week traveling like we used to travel for months. <laughs> hooking up from circuit to circuit. Sometimes you didn't know where you were going because sometimes your gigs would run out and you'd be in the States waiting to find out if you're on another tour. As soon as we heard that first Rush record, we were just like, what is this? This is like Canadian Zeppelin. Yeah. What the hell is that? And we literally said, we want that band to open Canada. We then took them across America. With KISS, we probably played 50, 60 shows in the first couple of tours, where they were just this weird band from New York. And we got very, very close. Regardless of what you want to say about KISS, musically or otherwise, there was no harder working band than KISS. And there was no band more determined to put on a spectacular show and give people their money's worth than KISS. That was a great thing to see as an opening act. We were so impressionable and we were so green. They were very good to us. Those guys like to have a good time, especially Gene. And their hotels were always fun to 
watch. <laughs> Every night after the show, the girls would line up. My God, you can even be an ugly bastard like me and get laid. And none of the Rush guys ever did it. I just never understood it. And I said, they're not gay. No. Farm animals? No, that's not it. I, what the fuck did you do when you went back to your hotel room? I mean, I even remember one night, it was in Milwaukee, I think, and there was a female bowling league sharing the same floor. And they're walking around in their nightgowns and their doors, the hotel room doors are open and they're drinking. All well, the guys are rushing by there in their rooms just watching TV after a gig. <laughs> they probably woke up the next day going, God, these Canadian bands sure are boring. <laughs> That was a getting to know you period for us and Neil. He was one of the weirdest people we'd ever met just because we never met anyone that was so literate and so opinionated before. And it was hard for him. He was always and still is the new guy in some strange way. Alex and I were bonded, old friends, and he had to kind of make his way to be part of that. In some ways, he was very serious, and we were totally goofy. Certainly, he had a bigger brain than us, and that was a uh... A target. <laughs> what more perfect portable education than having a lot of free time on your hands and bookstores everywhere. So uh, for the next few years, I'd say basically I started filling those hours uh, with reading. And we said, look how many books he reads. Look at the words he uses. This guy is probably capable of writing lyrics. <laughs> really stimulating but really a mouthful to sing in the kind of rocking style that we were doing at that time songs as we traveled my little handwritten lyric sheets for the time I think I wrote the cities that all of those songs were written and they varied widely all over the map it was like the monkeys you know I would have an acoustic guitar and we'd be working on a song in a rental car or in a hotel room after a show that's how pretty much fly by night was written that's the way bands used to do it they'd write the record while they were on the road they'd go home and cut it in two or three weeks and a new album would appear every six months pretty amazing to think of that today Fly by Night was a little different from the first record, so the record company wasn't sure if we were developing in the correct way. They wanted us to be more like Bad Company and not so much like this weird thing that we were becoming, Bytor and the Snow Dog. What the hell was that all about? With Bytor and the Snow Dog, that was the start of writing in more of a thematic, multi-piece idea. And then with Crest of Steel, we did the whole side, the Fountain of Lamnath, and the Necromancer was kind of like that. It was the start of those longer pieces. Neil had come up with this concept, and we had to put it all together and make it work. And it seemed like just an evolution of where they were going. I thought it had amazing potential. It's a dark record, but it was certainly a good record, I thought. But that view wasn't shared by everybody. I know we played Crest of Steel once for Paul Stanley. We just got it. We played it in our van for him one night. And you could see that he just, he didn't get it. A lot of people didn't get it. <laughs> and we wondered if we even got it. I think we were pretty high when we made a lot of that record. <laughs> and it sounds like it to me. My eyes have just been opened. Caress of Steel was not well received by the record company. It was not well received by our agents. 
everything took an awful downturn. And it was off the crest of a wave, too, because we were so in love with what we've done, you know? We were so into it and so proud of it. When Crest of Steel pretty much met a deaf ear, the ensuing tour, we were opening acts on smaller tours and playing backwater clubs, and we called it at the time the Down the Tubes Tour. You would find yourself in places like Battle Creek, Michigan, playing to 20 people, wondering why you were still continuing. Everybody thought that it was over. The audiences were becoming smaller and smaller, so we thought the end was near. At that time, Ted Nugent was also not breaking. <laughs> So the two of us played a lot of small clubs together. It was a pretty depressing tour. We were kind of lost, figured that we would probably not survive to see another tour. And the record company was really not happy with us, and our management was trying to defend us. I remember going to Chicago and meeting with Mercury Records to not give up on the band, to not drop the band. I nodded to every request they had. They wanted singles, more commercial. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I'm sure that's what they're going to do. That was a terrible winter. I had no money. I was sleeping on a friend's couch. Things couldn't have been bleaker, really. The record company, everybody was, oh, we're going to have to be more commercial here and think about some singles and, and just leaning on us at our weakest. We talked about how we would rather go down fighting than try to make the kind of record they wanted us to make. We made 2112, figuring everyone would hate it, but we were going to go out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> we all decided that we would rather go back to our jobs working on a farm or working as a plumber's mate for my dad or whatever than give in and just be something that everybody else wants us to be. We did summon that strength of character to say, no, we won't do that. We're doing it our way, and if this is the last hurrah, fine. You know, back to the farm equipment dealership for me. It was a big no. No, we're not doing any of that. No, you can't tell us what to do. And no, we don't care. <laughs> heard a full side concept like the first side of 2112 people panicked they thought wow we're screwed they didn't get it this was like i ordered salmon and they brought me a steak what the hell is this the nature of the story itself that evolved in 2112 of course was the individual against the mass and that album did communicate and reach people on a level that just blossomed outward by the classic form of word of mouth obviously the opening 20 minute piece did not get played on the radio I can't wait to share this new wonder Well, the people will all see its light Let them all make their own music The priest raised my name on this night Suddenly it was like, you gotta check this band out. And, you know, the first thing that struck you was the level of musicianship was just insane. I remember vividly, I was in my bedroom with my neighbor and he brought over 2112. It was just something I'd never heard before. Just the fact that it was a three-piece ripping and they were pulling off this stuff that sounded like a huge prog rock production. It took me on a journey instantly and I looked at the album cover and saw that there were only three of them and they were wearing some funky clothes <laughs> but I thought how can three guys make such a sound? I remember the keyboard sound, and all of a sudden it kicked in, and it was just like a whole new experience to music, something I'd never heard before. Uh, the drumming was incredible. The bass playing was incredible. That was it. That's what did it for me, man. I was hooked on Rush ever since then. There was a moment in my life, and I and I. I willingly admit this, that I actually knew how to play the entire side. I knew how to play 2112 all the way down. I knew every note, every moment. And I think back now, I think, how long did I have to fucking learn that? <laughs> you know, I must have sat in the bedroom for a year to learn that fucking song. I was into the story. You know, I read the back, and it was dedicated to the Fountainhead, the book. And I went right out and bought the Fountainhead and read it. I mean, I, not too many bands make a 12-year-old go out and buy the Fountainhead by Iron <laughs> God damn, this rock band's got me all fired up about literature. <laughs> turned 
out, the concept record went through the roof. And they were right. 2112 really bought us our independence. The record company has never been in on a single session that we've ever done. And in fact, when we're done, it's all packaged and they accept it the way it is. They have no choice. That somehow was the plateau of untouchable. Nobody thought they had the right anymore. So yeah, 2112 was absolutely the passepartout, you know, the skeleton key that opened that door that we could close behind us. Okay, from now on, ah, we do what we want. Most critics ignored 2112 or treated Rush, I think, very, very negatively. I mean, what do critics hate generally? They hate heavy metal and they hate progressive music. I would say probably most of the reviews were bad. I don't know if it was discouraging to read bad press. I mean, after a while, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever. Usually it's critics back then, particularly, just trying to be cool and hip. So they, they would, you know, write all sorts of things. What you own is your own kingdom. What you do is your own glory. What you love is your own power. What you live is your own story. In your head is the answer. Let it guide you along. Let your heart be the anchor and the beat of your soul. Getty's soaring voice is described in some rather unkind ways. A hamster in overdrive. The dead howling in Hades. Mickey Mouse on helium. Strangling a hamster. A cat being chased out the door with a blowtorch up its ass. There was constant insults hurled that way, but it was never like that with the audiences. We found that we had a growing audience that didn't care about any of that press stuff, that they were into the band and they liked what we were trying to do and we were a little more thoughtful about the way we wrote music and certainly how we wrote lyrics and how we put it all together. And I'd rather read fan reviews than some guy who always hated us and didn't stay for half the show. Critically, we were designated terminally unhip and that prevents you from getting mainstream press. Our songs were too long to go on mainstream radio. So what the hell are we? Every once in a while you have an artist that is very sophisticated, but somehow in their sophistication they don't alienate the common person. They're really a people's band, and the great hole in their career has been that they've never been truly accepted by the intelligentsia. But with a band like Rush, you can't say, well, they can't play, they can't sing. So what was it? Well, they're nerdy or they're, they just don't fit in a neat box. The one constant with Rush throughout the decades is that it has been difficult to fit them into any kind of definition. Their music was hard rock, but at the same time, it was orchestral. The melodies were simple, but at the same time, complex. Nobody could ever really put their finger on exactly what they were. I think the fashion that was associated with it defied definition as well. We were never very good at the whole fashion image thing. Let's face it, we didn't have a clue. We desperately just wanted to wear jeans and t-shirts, but were raised in a period that said that's not okay. So we looked for some way of standing out in the crowd. I remember we were in San Francisco and we're staying in the Japanese part of town. So we found all these kind of kimonos and rows. We said, hey, why don't we try these? So that began the period of the absurdly prophetic robes. be the ones who start to mold a new reality closer to the heart closer to the heart blacksmith These were the salad days because we were transitioning and we could feel it. The world was expanding for us, starting to record in England, starting to get success in England, and to go over there and actually have a song on the charts and play Amherst Methodian was really gratifying because all of our heroes were English rock musicians. So that gave us a tremendous amount of confidence. Whoa! to 
methods progressed, the palette got bigger and bigger. Neil was constantly changing and adding to his drum kit. And we had more choice of guitars and acoustic guitars, bass pedals. The keyboards developed every time we went into the studio. Ged was staying on top of that. The first time I worked with the band, it was a three-piece. I think we may have had a cowbell. <laughs> really helped us get out of that robe period was touring with UFO. They made fun of us relentlessly and they would hold up signs and make fun of our lyrics and I would go up to my microphone and there'd be a pair of furry slippers nailed to the stage beside my mic and they used to call me Glee and guys would be at the side telling me it goes perfect with your robe Glee. It was good for us because you know you go on stage thinking that maybe there has to be some other thing but in the end, it, it is always back to the music for us. Hemispheres was the album that broke the camel's back in terms of long songs. The Hemisphere side of that album was incredibly complex, both thematically and structurally. When I was me, well, to a little farmhouse in Wales and wrote all that music, arranged it, learned how to play it. It was so ambitious and so demanding, so experimental, all of that. It was quite manic. And our hours became later and later and later. And, and it just kind of went around so that we were going to bed at noon and we were getting up at 7 o'clock and having breakfast then and then working through the night to the morning, unending with no time off. Even the shorter songs on that record, like La Villa Strangiato, were really hard. And of course, we were bound and determined to record La Villa Strangiato live in one take. It was so complicated and went through so many different mood and time signature changes, it would needed to have been charted out in order to keep track of where you were at any given point. I think we spent 11 days trying to record the bed track only. And we finally had to admit defeat. We had to do it in three parts. That one kind of slow open soul that Alex plays, the way he, he built that up had a huge impression on me because he was creating a mood by playing very, very sparsely and just slowly amping up the intensity. I just thought that was the greatest thing in terms of lead guitar dynamics and phrasing. I see them as the high priests of conceptual metal. Big influence, huge. Probably the hardest song I ever learned how to play was La Via Strangiata. The drumming is, it takes everything you got to get through it. That was the benchmark of drumming when I was a kid. I could play YYZ, but can you play La Via Strangiata? We'd 
written material that was really a little beyond us, considering our level of musicianship at the time. And that was the thing about Rush, we we're always overreaching. When you listen to early Rush, I mean, it was like the riffs were simpler. It got more complex as it kept going. With the arrangements, it would be so long. You know, it'd be like the boys would be up there going, we did write this, didn't we? You know, it's like, what part of the song are we in? If you could learn those songs, that was a stepping stone to just about everything you needed to know. If you could play those songs with some proficiency, you could play pretty much anything else. Just eerily precise. Everything was just right on the nuggets. Like, I bet if you went in with a computer, Neil Peart would probably be right on the beat to, like, an atom. Or at least that's how it sounds when you're listening with the headphones. You're like, oh, he's not even human. Getty Lee is still my favorite bass player. And be like, wow, that guy who's shredding the bass is also singing and playing the keyboards with his feet and hands. And he would move his microphone a lot with his nose, which was he actually figured a way to use it. If it weren't for the nose, I don't think he could have done the keyboards and bass and singing. I really don't. I think the nose was what it enabled him to get the microphone where he needed to be. He has a, a big nose. Props to the nose. you know we were overreaching ourselves and we agreed among ourselves in 1978 when we finished hemispheres we're not doing this again you know mm. we're not making this kind of record again mm. we knew that was the end of that era mm. of the, the epics you've been touring now for how many years well professionally in the united states and around yeah. the world about five years about five years how many concerts do you average a year uh, about 200 maybe more 200 concerts a year for five years are you how long can you keep that as long as we can as long as we're still standing we were working all the time. I remember at one point we counted 17 one-nighters in a row. We were getting fried and getting stupid, not taking care of ourselves, just burning out. We didn't like what we were becoming as people. In my personal life, I was getting alienated from my wife. We were just starting to have kids. And once you start introducing children into your life, you can't be so selfish. You just can't. I think we all cherish the fact that we're pretty normal guys. I got married when I was young. I had a family early. I introduced Getty's wife to him when we were teenagers. Family was the most important thing to me in my life. We were trying to remember music is just one of the things we had chosen to do with our lives, not everything. If we'd kept going like that, we would have crashed. Something started to break. I think the heaviness of Hemispheres made us want to run away from that kind of album. So we ran from Hemispheres straight into Spirit of Radio. was a joy to me. We were in Canada, you know, our families were close. That's when we discovered the studio, and the songs just came together. I mean, it was just boom, boom, boom. Okay, the new album. There are a number of new things on this album, new approaches to the album. Tell me what's new about it. You tell them. Um, basically, it's newness derived from experiments that I guess we've conducted over the last couple of albums through Hemispheres and Farewell to Kings. We were experimenting with a lot of new instruments and sounds, and rhythmic approaches and so on. This time, we found ways to put all those directions into a single stream, and consequently, I think the album probably has a more direct feel to it. The whole music industry is going primitive, new wave, minimal, rock and roll. Do you care? Some bands have gone back to basics kind of thing, but those are the bands that can't do anything but play basics. But uh, all the real interesting new wave bands seem to be developing and progressing into more interesting styles. Who do you listen to at home? 
all kinds of people. You've recently been talking heads and on the turntable a lot. The police. I was a huge fan of the police and Ultravox and all these new English bands. I loved them. It became a part of our sensibility. Permanent Wave still had a couple of longer songs on it, but The Spirit of Radio was the emblematic song of that period. And the mix of sounds in it, the approach, electronic music and reggae, that's all the stuff I was listening to. <laughs> of the prophets were written on the stupid wall. seem to have that knack of being able to use time signatures at will and yet make them feel seamless. If you're changing time signatures and your audience aren't really aware of it, then you've got something special. Rush finds a real interesting way of sort of drawing a straight line through the song whether it's melodically or rhythmically. When you put together the sound of the band being so recognized and their ability to make sure that there's a lifeline for people out there that can't quite tap their foot to an odd time signature, that makes what Rush does genius when it comes to still being able to be played on the radio. We are secrets to each other Each one's life I think Permanent Waves was, in, in a way, the most important stepping stone because just like Caress of Steel's to 2112, there would be no moving pictures without Permanent Waves first. As I define it, that's when we became us. We, I think Rush was born with moving pictures, really. represents so much that we learned up to that time and about songwriting, about arrangement. That's when we brought our band identity together too, how we like to play individually and as a band at the same time. Now when I look back on those songs, I'm glad to say to people that I will never get tired of playing Tom Sawyer, because it's always difficult to play right, you know, and anytime I do play it right, I feel good. Suddenly, we were on the radio everywhere that summer. Our concert audiences doubled. You could just picture it in the high school halls. You going to see Rush? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm going. You know, we were that band that year. We were playing 120, 130 cities in America. We were going back to places where if we were a theater act at the start of that tour, by the end of that cycle, we'd gone back to those places and we were in the arena. Their latest release, Moving Pictures, is number one on Toronto's album charts, and they're close to selling out an unprecedented three nights at the full Maple Leaf Gardens. Here's a cut from Moving Pictures, platinum after only four weeks of release.
moving pictures was a mixed blessing to me in retrospect, in, in, for me personally in my life. A lot of strange people came out of the woodwork. There was so much attention on us at that time that, that was transitory. You know, generally, we were pretty private, and I think moving pictures was the turning point when there was a lot more pressure from fans and from people wanting a piece of you or believing they were connected to you in some other way. There was a time when we first started getting recognized that I got a little touchy about it. And I remember I started thinking about this thing about fame and how you deal with it. That was kind of an epiphany. And I said to myself, I'm going to go where I want to go. And if somebody comes up to me and he's nice to me and wants an autograph, I got time for him. It's no big deal. Getty, right? That's right. Oh my god, that's Getty? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm just making That's it. No problem. That's it. One is two. One is to Shawnee. Me to get your way through. The first one's to Shawnee. And the next one's to Troy. Okay, that's it, I promise. I'm so sorry. For you. you want his too? Yes, he's the leader of the group. <laughs> I can walk around the city and get recognized from time to time. Getty more so. He's got a very distinctive look about him. But generally, people are very polite. They don't want too much from you. I understand that these are your fans that just love what you do. There's been a moment in their lives where your music has been so important to them that to take a couple of minutes and just chat, shake a hand, or a hug or something, it's not a big deal. I remember when I met them, I was just struck by Getty Lee and Lifeson's friendship. It seemed like they had a real deep bond, real playful and sort of goofy. It just seemed like there was a lot of joy there, a lot of, a lot of genuine fun. And then I turned the corner, and then I saw the master, Neil Peart. He had sort of a different vibe going, just as focused, but a brewing intensity, little wisps of darkness. And Neil has a real struggle with fans, and it's not a personal thing. It's a shyness thing. He's not able to be as relaxed around strangers as Alex or I am. You know, he doesn't mean to hurt anyone's feelings by it. He's not trying to be rude. He's just not comfortable. OK, I was the world's biggest Who fan as a kid. I never dreamed of trying to find their hotel and knocking on their door or interfering in their lives in any way. That's, I don't understand. I love being appreciated. Being respected is awfully good. But anything beyond that just creeps me out. You know, any sense of adulation is just, like, so wrong. I got a chance to go meet Neil Peart, and I got brought into a room, and I started to tell him, hey, I'm the hugest fan ever, and I got sort of the Neil Peart cold shoulder, and the security guard removed me from the room. It was a weird, uncomfortable situation. I love Neil Peart, even though he totally blacklisted me. <laughs> but I would understand, like, if I was Neil Peart and I walked in the room, I would probably want to remove me, too. <laughs> Neil was great, very intense man, but, very, you know, his line, I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend, that's Neil. People have a fantasy, I don't want to trample on it, but I also don't want to live it. And people can think that I'm antisocial or a sourpuss or anything. It's really not. It doesn't make me mad, it embarrasses me. The other guys, you know, are obviously comfortable with it, and they do the meets and greets every night, and then fine, so, you know, they can do it. I am so appreciative of our fans. I bless their hearts every single day. But they're hard to analyze as a group because they're so different. We have hardcore fans, the old fans that have been there from the beginning, and they're usually male, and they are really intense. stages it was very young almost 100% male and then as the years went by it remained 100% male <laughs> the chicks did not really dig it you know I still don't throw on caressive steel that often with my wife around <laughs> Tonight is my 113th Rush show. The last time I missed a show anywhere in Europe was on the Signals Tour. Tonight will be the seventh on this tour. Been to two in America, one in Canada. Did all six in the last UK tour. My name's Pete. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I just had my 100th show in Stockholm. <laughs> Rush fans are like NASCAR fans. They ain't going anywhere, man. They're brand loyalty. 
they are a cult band. When you go to a Rush concert, there ain't anybody leaving until the song is over. They're waiting for their favorite part, they're nudging their friend, they're going, look, he played it perfect. They're riveted to the band. The band have that relationship with their audience, where their audience really feel like the Rush lyrics communicate to them, make them feel like their experience is heard. I have this memory of sitting in the basement with my, um, my mother. I actually said to her, I want to play you a song. And it was very hard to ever get my parents' attention or anything, so it was like a big deal. Will you please sit here, and I want to play you a song. And I played Entree New, and I gave her the lyric sheet because I wanted her to understand that this song was connecting with me on some level. When I was 16 years old, I wasn't as emotionally open. I was very withdrawn. So something about that song allowed me to say, somehow this song is almost like it's written for me. Music when you're growing up is like such a strong part of like, what do you like? What's your deal? What's your identity? Rush seemed to be just a complete added dimension of not being just obsessed with girls and hair and shit like that. You know what I mean? They seem to be kind of smart. And of course, fancying myself as a really smart kid, I was like, oh, that's my deal. Not so clearly charted. It's really just a question of your honesty. Yeah, your honesty. Glittering prizes and endless compromises shatter the illusion of integrity. Yeah, dudes. I mean, when you're when you're hearing like lyrics like that that are so earnest and sincere, talking about honesty in art and asking some of the tougher intellectual questions with that great music behind it, they really offered something in rock that was in short supply. And plus, they sang in French. On circumstances, plus c'est la même, plus c'est la même chose. That was pretty tricky. You didn't hear that on any Kiss records. It's like the dude is singing in French now. I'm just, I can't even figure out his English. It wasn't for everybody, you know, and it wasn't necessarily cool. You were kind of like a rush geek, you know, a music nerd, a, a kind of nerd, and it was sort of nerdy music, I suppose. <laughs> in the subdivisions and it just seemed like exactly my life you know I was that kid who was watching the car drive away with all the cool kids going off to a party that I wasn't invited to it was just nice to feel like there was a rock song out there that spoke to my experience trying to be cool and worrying about being cast out of a group of friends if you weren't cool I wasn't very cool but luckily I had a group of friends that was equally not cool I lived in a housing development suburbia, backyard barbecues, and a lot of the stuff that I think most American kids could relate to. I remember watching the video, I'm like, damn, that represents me right there. This one person walking around, not really being in a group, it seemed like it was this person that nobody really could relate to. The thing I loved about Neil was he took very complex metaphysical themes and he was able to put them in a way that everybody could understand. And whether he was ripping off Shakespeare or he was quoting his own heart, he was able to do it in a way that never felt snobby or always felt like he was in the room talking to you. Words can carry different freight for different people, of course, but those who do have the sensitivity to pay the kind of attention to lyrics that I put into them, it's wonderful to connect that way, to feel that you're not playing down to anyone. We've always had the impression that people are just as smart as we are, so if we can figure this stuff out, they can too, you know? And we're not being that, that terrible, damning word, pretentious. We're not pretending anything. This is really what turned us on this year, you know? Lyrically, it's always been a reflection of my times and the times I observe. But everyone is a reflection of me. all over again but we're too curious we're too dissatisfied with where we're at and just because we got successful doesn't mean we're gonna stop and that's the motivation we have to find the better rush 
was a big shift happening on signals. The keyboards were becoming more and more important, from Getty's standpoint, that is. And also, one of the biggest things at that point for me was Neil getting into the electronic drum kit. Didn't really appeal to me. I wanted to still have that element of the basic acoustic band. We'd been working with Terry for 10 years at that point, and we really felt the need to expand and, and see what it was like to work with other people. And it was a very tough transition because we were so close. Really, Terry was like the fourth member of the band. It was Neil who broke the news to me on the bus, and he said, you know, just think of it like a, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend. They want to split up for a while and have a break from each other. I was surprised because I figured we would figure it out and we'd move to the next level. But it was time for a change. And I didn't really want to do an electronic band, which is where I thought it was going. A new wind comes rising across the cities of the plain. There's no swimming in the heavy water, no singing in the acid rain. Red alert, red alert. To be honest with you, I'd never really heard of Rush in England. I was a pop producer, so I was kind of bemused when I got the call to come and produce them. I was coming from that whole British 80s music scene. I was trying to bring them into line with what I perceived to be the contemporary modern pop music, the new technology, the new keyboard sounds. We all loved the music of that time. We were young enough to, and we didn't have any protective nature of what Rush was, that it could never be allowed to be influenced by new wave music or could never use an African rhythm. There was no such thing as that doesn't suit Rush. Those words have never been uttered. Ragged lines of ragged gray Skeletons they shuffle away Shouting gods and smoking guns Synthesizers and technology became a way of sparking your creativity. I liked it because my need to write melodies is more satisfied writing on a keyboard. As a songwriter, you're always looking for an angle to give you something fresh. Coming from a trained keyboard background, you always felt kind of left out in the rock world because keyboards really weren't that cool. Rush was one of those bands that the way they started integrating synths seemed wildly exciting to me. And wow, this can actually fill the role that what a guitar player would have done. Eats up the mid-range rhythm section space. I'd be hard pressed to think of another, someone else who's done it like that. Once the keyboards and the shorter songs became more of their sound, that's when I kind of moved on to other things. I didn't like it, and I still really don't like it that much. And Getty would spend a lot of time on the keyboard, and as a bass player, I love the bass. And so when my favorite bass player is playing the keyboards, I'm not that psyched about it. Well, I love the idea of the keyboards. When we first started, I think as that part of our sound developed, there were times where we just got on the wrong track. Alex and I had some real disagreements about how profound the keyboard should be. But Power Windows is a really important record because it was the final and essential blending of keyboards and guitar to me for Rush. With Power Windows, I found it really, really difficult to work around the way the keyboards were developing. Why am I looking for a different place? I shouldn't be looking for a different place. What, what's going on with these keyboards? You know, they're not even real. It's not even a real instrument. The more we think we know about, the greater the unknown. We suspend our disbelief. We are not alone. Mystic rhythm. Capture my thoughts. Carry them away. You know, I love the synthesizers, and I actually think it's just as important as any of their other work. The ultimate thing that people were saying was they kind of moved somewhat away from the rock, and they kind of got a little bit more in the middle of what they did. To me, you know, Rush Middle of the Road is still somebody else's left field. There are certain periods of Rush that are more universal than other periods. Now, you could say on the one hand that maybe they're better records, 
Maybe that's the best rush. Moving Pictures got us into a much broader world of rock fans. And when there was a shift, we lost some of those people. But we realized after time that there was a core of our fan base that was as curious as to where we were going as we were. And those are the ones that have sustained us, you know, through all these years. And I can't fault them for not wanting to be a prog rock band for another 15 years. They had different periods. That's what makes them interesting. Hold Your Fire was the record that told me that there was a shift in the way we were writing it was pushing us away from rock. It was starting to move into a jazzier, softer kind of tonal area. Things can go too far in any one direction and then we correct ourselves and eventually go, whoa, you know, we tried to go along this way but it's too much. That was the very first thing I said in the first meeting. It seems absolutely crazy to me that one of the few remaining power trios on this planet, guitar, bass and drums, are smothered in keyboards. And I said, my interest is to get you back to being a power trio, but in modern take, we just find out what that contemporary definition of power trio. Win an instrument and push the keyboards aside. And Getty and I would go, okay, <laughs> we can do that. Alex is pretty, let's have a concept, let's not have keyboards. And I went along with it. I was a little bit sad. Press down and roll the bones for me were very much indicative of what was going on in the 80s. And there were thin sounding records too, they didn't have any balls to them. So when I got in there, I was kind of hell bent on making a heavy record. The caveman pushed us, you know, wanted me to use my Fender bass, go through old Ampeg amps and record it old school. Everything was old school. There were battles because every engineer wants Alex to play without his pedals and all his own synthesizers that he plugs into. When Alex would ask for his fridge of effects and I would just say no and you'd say, you know, I, I want reverb and I'd say no. And he'd say, I fucking want reverb. If I want some reverb, then I want some reverb. And I'm like, no, you sound terrible with reverb. You're not having any reverb. So we, <laughs> we ended up going to a bar that night and drinking the butt five bottles of scotch had terrible hangovers the next day but we sort of ironed it out we had a lot of few drinks together and i know what kevin was going for and he's right counterparts turned out to be the record that we envisioned when we first started working on it the songs were thicker and more hair on them that record was a big turning point in reconnecting with the kind of rock and roll guts of rush <laughs> The opening song, Animate, I think is one of our all-time best. I love the drive of it, I love the arrangement of it, but I was starting to get conflicted about my own drumming at that point. I'd been working so much with sequencers and with click tracks for so many years, and I had developed really good precision of time. But I felt a stiffness because of that metronomic need, but I didn't have the looseness that I wanted to hear out of my own playing. After so many years of being an amazing player, Neil could have clearly just decided not to play drums until it was time to go play a Rush show. But instead, he cared enough about what he did to try and break down his current technique and work with Freddy Gruber and sort of reinvent his playing style. I was in New York doing a Buddy Rich tribute recording. Over that recording session in New York, I met Freddie and had dinner and, and uh, got curious. What would it be like to study with a guy like that? And I had the time, so I thought, yes, I'm going to try this. It's not to make it sound easy, because when I studied with Freddie, I asked myself, can I really do this? Will I have the discipline? It's a huge commitment. Can you tell me about when you met Neil and what your first impressions of him were? He was easy, you know, because he wasn't nuts. <laughs> And I was, you know, and it was like, you know, it was fun. It didn't have to go to some strange land. We never played the drums. We talked about motion and uh, told a lot of stories and did some dancing. We were behind a set of drums because the approach to what you do results in what you get. 
You understand? Freddie is all about the motion. And it was all about the, the motion of the hands and feet that contributed to a dance. And one of the first things he did was stand up and do a little soft shoe dance for me. And saying, when you're doing that, is that dance happening on the floor? No, it's happening in the air. So these were revelations to me to start thinking about not just the hit, but the motions between. Time is linear. It's, uh, it's not... Uh, it's like the, a pogo stick, you know. A lot of pop music is played like that. It's extremely vertical. It's like people slapping water when they swim. Mm, yeah. It doesn't... Inefficient motion. Breathe. Let's put it this way. You can have a beautiful body and look marvelous. Thank you. But, <laughs> but if you're not breathing, <clears throat> it's not alive. You know, so you got to at least put the breath in there, huh? I can play a simple beat now completely different from how I would have played that simple beat 15 years ago. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> there you go. It takes a lot of courage, being a drummer of the stature that Neil Peart is, to be able to say, I can improve. And when he came back out and he made his appearances after working with Freddie and he turned his grip around, his tr traditional grip, and had a different approach, he was so much more relaxed. That was the most refreshing thing you could have seen, is that your hero could also still learn that they weren't just done. And I worked with my bandmates right after that on the Test for Echo songs, and the other guys would say, well, it still sounds like you. And at first I was kind of disappointed, but then I thought, well, of course it does. They thought it sounded the same, but the, when they went to play with me, there was a different clock at work now. Driven day and night in circles Spinning like a whirlwind of leaves Steaming in and out back alleys Driven to another den of thieves It's my turn to drive But it's my turn to drive Driven to the margin of error Driven to the edge of control Driven to the margin of terror Driven to the edge of a deep dark hole In mid August of 97, we finished the tour earlier that summer, and there was a message to call the office. It was urgent. One of the girls from our office told me what had happened. Neil's daughter was in a terrible car accident and lost her life. I mean, it was just such a horrible shock. It was, I mean, I can still feel it today. It was the start of a whole lot of emotions that we'd never felt before. I had not, uh, had, not had a friend who'd gone through anything like this. Ray called me and told me about the accident and uh, I was just in shock as everyone was. You're just so unprepared for how devastating it is um, and you just don't know what to do or how to help or, or, or any of that. He could be such a private guy and when news like this hits, you don't want to do the wrong thing. You don't want to try to comfort them and find out that you're only just comforting yourself. Everything to do with the band ended at that moment. It, it just didn't seem important. It's, it was not something you even thought about thinking about. They didn't really know what to do with themselves, so they left Toronto. They got away from all those reminders. And then Jackie got sick. After she passed away, he was uh, lost. And so he ran, he got on his motorcycle and ran. When his wife died, he had to do what he needed to do to, to just find some kind of peace. He embarked on a long, very, very painful journey, just going and going and going and going. Yeah, everybody was so worried about me. And in fact, there was a network I know among my friends and loved ones. Oh, I heard from him today. I, you know, I got a postcard or he called, you know, they would all t reassure each other. Because yeah, anything could have happened to me even by accident, let alone by design. Fuck, we were so worried about him. Uh, I just, but he, you know, he was at arm's length. Neil needed time. But to be honest, I had no real interest in music for, about a year, I, I hardly played, I hardly listened to music. We 
we were on sabbatical. We were shut down. Basically, we're talking about a journey that stretched 55,000 miles, starting from Quebec and going up to the Arctic and around Alaska and all Mexico, across all of Mexico, from Baja, across the whole Mexican mainland, down to Belize. I go to the small towns and the back roads, generally stopping for the night in motels along the way. And um, I don't think in that whole 55,000 miles, I don't know if I was ever recognized once in a little town in a gas station or a motel or a diner because I'm just a guy sitting there with a hat on reading the book, you know? A lot of times I can just slip around and be a guy, and that's all I want from traveling, too. I just want to be a guy, and that's life enough for me. Travel has always been known as a soothing bomb, you know, and even motion from the time we're little babies, you know, we want to be rocked, and if a baby's crying, you can take it for a drive in the car and it calms down. Uh, that's the way I described it to myself at that time, that I was so stirred up into my little baby soul would only be soothed by motion. I traveled out of the darkest place a human being can come from, and it was landscapes, highways, and wildlife that revitalized me, the timeless landscapes, gives your tiny existence a new perspective when you're among things that are millions of years old. I remember getting postcards from him from wherever, and he was using different names. We have like about 6,000 nicknames for each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I would get a postcard with that nickname on it, so I knew who it was from. They were lifelines, you know, those little contacts. And he knew we were there somewhere, and he knew that we would be there if he wanted us to be there. All he had to do was reach out. As far as the band was concerned, as things went on, it seemed less and less of a possibility that we would get back together. And, and it looked like, you know, the band was basically, it was four years that the band was done. Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was over. Uh, you know, Alex and I would talk about it once in a while, but there was no point, you know. I don't want to play in Rush without those other two guys, you know. There's no replacing <laughs> anybody in this band. It's just not possible. It is the band, the three of us, you know. Even though he's the new guy, <laughs> he's just as important. <laughs> those two guys were the most stable. Thing I had my, my family and loved ones and those that dared to stay around me through that time and so hard to you know I would have walked <laughs> my concern was just that he would be okay and I thought it was pointless to think about it beyond that after I don't know a year and a half whatever two years I sensed that he would do it again that he would be okay I don't think he worked that hard to be what most people consider is the best in the world at something and not go and do it again one day I didn't know if it meant that it would take five years or ten years but I thought that one day he'd have to do that again stopped riding, <laughs> I was ready. Um, traveling all that time, it was when I came to rest and I, I came out to California and met my wife-to-be and uh, I got some stability there and with, with Carrie's help, um, then realized that I was, uh, I was wanting to work again. That's basically what it, what it took. I had to stop moving first. He was a little apprehensive and thought that perhaps maybe we might try to talk about perhaps trying to maybe think about possibly getting back in the studio to record a record. And it was really like that. It was quite a fragile, delicate proposition. I don't think he knew if he could do it. You know, he hadn't played his drums in a hell of a long time. He's such a perfectionist, He's such a fucking monster musician. I think he was afraid of not being as good as he once was. 
it was an unsureness for me especially can i do this can i write rock lyrics like it's the most important thing in the world can i slave over and over and over on a drum part to refine every detail of it like it's the most important thing in the world i don't know we basically booked the studio seven days a week for 14 or 15 months everything had so much weight to it and for him to get back his chops was really a slow process i could hear my state of mind in my drumming anger obviously but confusion that the state i was in and it's in the lyrics too of course so many of them had to deal with you know i could not sidestep all of that stuff but there was something that was so pure and truthful about the energy on vapor trails it really is a representation of that time of the coming back of the band <laughs> Coming back to the stage is way more difficult because also that's the essential existence of a band is on a stage. I've come back to that many times and one of the things that keeps me from quitting touring all the time is that's what a band does. So coming back to the stage was the biggest recovery possible. Thank you. And good evening. Hartford, United States of America, nice to be back here. It's been quite long enough, I think. That was in Hartford, Connecticut on the Vapor Trails tour. And it was such a dramatic thing after all this that we'd gone through that here we were at our first gig back on the road and we never even thought we would work again. I think it was one of the few times we've had a group hug before the show. <laughs> it wasn't lost on us that uh, getting to that point was almost impossible. So, you know, we kind of looked at each other, gave each other a hug, and said, okay, let's go. The crowd was amazing. They welcomed us back, really warm. And Neil was really nervous. So I figured my job is to go over there and to make him not nervous. So I kept checking on him, throwing him some shapes to make sure he was smiling or laughing. That's what that night was like. I was completely folded into the job of performing, but there were just moments when the three of us connected visually and we knew what we were doing. And I remember saying to Ray afterwards that it would have been a shame if that never happened again. It was amazing. And it was amazing to see how happy he was after the show. There were some demons were gone that night. Part of the rebirth of the band was suddenly a willingness to go where we hadn't gone. And to see these legions of fans, it was such a positive effect on us. It was like, OK, this is a second chance for us to go back out and play some new places. <laughs> idea going to Brazil of any popularity that we might have. And then the Sao Paulo show was 60,000 people. I mean, by far the largest audience we singularly have ever played to. There was a sense of wild, tumultuous, impossible masses of people, but so locked in a unifying way that it was just magical. We elevated. Having gone through that whole tour, being in this place where we had people going totally mental, 
playing one little victory. It was a huge victory that we'd survived the previous five years. Finishing on such a high note was quite a trip. The newness of touring was over, and I think we had successfully returned. There's a lot of people who were 18 in 1978. Guys who were crazy Rush fans. They're in positions of relative power now. They're raising their hands and going, yeah, I want to be on this bandwagon now. I always was there. Now they have the ability to actually bring it to more people than ever before. My guests tonight have 24 gold and 14 platinum records. Please welcome Rush! Getty. Neil, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that this is your first appearance on American television in 33 years, yes. correct? I think one of the greatest things to happen to the collective community that has very much enjoyed Rush for many years was their appearance on the Colbert Report because I've seen these guys get beaten up by this supposed cool people for a long time. And then in one fell swoop, Stephen Colbert puts them on their show and gives them the hand of coolness. You're, you're known for, for some sort of long songs. Um, have you ever written a song so epic that by the end of the song, you were actually being influenced by yourself at the beginning of the song? Because it happened so much earlier in your career. You are yet to be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, is there any chance your next album will be called, That's Bullshit? <laughs> you could get into the sociological and cultural reasons why a band like Rush was publicly marginalized. And you could say, what was it? Was it they were too weird, Getty's voice? I like to think that at the end of the day, people will step back and all those labels fall away because the body of work is significant. To me, they remain one of the top bands in the world. Now, whether some guy at Rolling Stone decides they are or not is completely irrelevant. Because at the end of the day, rock is a people's game, and the people have generally and consistently voted for this band. There's a generation of rock critics that have kept them from being in Rolling Stone and from being a part of that conversation. They were on the other side of this divide that we're talking about back when they were held in corners by Rush fans at parties going, but you don't understand, but you don't understand. And they really liked Elvis Costello or they really liked David Bowie or something that was a little more critically accepted. And now it's kind of like we're all so old that even if you hated Rush in the 80s and 70s, now you got to give it up for him. You just got to, or else you're just being an old dickhead. I think that in many ways you're served better if you're not quite as successful. If you never become a pop star, if you don't have top 40 hits, then what you have is kind of a pure memory for people. They don't think you ever sold out. Virtue is actually rewarded, I believe. The thing with us is we've always walked along the shore of the mainstream and we've been attached to it and connected ourselves to it time and again, but we've always been a little bit outside of it. We had our own stream <laughs> and it wasn't the main one, but it was not too far away from the main one. I always like to consider us the world's most popular cult band. The Rush fan, while it's a stereotype that it's like mostly guys who like heavy metal, there are many devoted female fans. It's kind of like a giant club. People turn on their kids to Rush, who turn on their kids to Rush. It's just amazing that the music's been able to go from this generation to this generation, and even a younger generation. You know. Their fans have stuck with them through all of it. 
all their shows are sold out still. I mean, when Snakes and Arrows came out in 2007, it charted really well for quite a while, and it was some of the biggest shows they've ever played. It's just amazing for them to come back really strong like that. It was just like, it took off. It took off again all of a sudden. It seems like they're bigger now than they've ever been, which is fantastic. There's a comfort in knowing that those same three guys are out there. And it's also spectacular to see three guys that can tolerate each other for all these years and still make music, make good music. How many more times? Hey, Derek, here's that thing you ordered. <laughs> it, got, it arrived today, this thing you ordered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lurch. That's right. It's that special, <laughs> special thing. <laughs> Can you turn that off while I use it? <laughs> Three stooges all at once. They're just such a unique and, and weird concoction. And I get the sense, and I always have from Rush, that they're on a righteous path. There's something there that's really pure, sincere, and honest. At the root of all of it, it's also really good, you know? That matters more than anything else. There's a magic and a coolness to them that continues to this day, and that's a testament to the music's power. I mean, that's how you know. It's the only way you know. You check in after 25 years. Is it still resonating? Yeah. It's the only true test. Just in time. All right, shall we? Now. What I mean, now? You mean now? I mean, right no. now. Now. I can't go on now. I've got things to do. Uh -huh. Talk about stuff, I guess. Drink some local wine. Will there be any discussion of the next steps for the band? Well, we don't really want to hang around with the guy. So, yeah, we'll talk about that stuff. This is just a business meeting. <laughs> we uh, have business meetings? <laughs> this is the first one. This will be your 24th record? What's the motivation to keep doing it? Chicks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I call this meeting to order. Very, very, very. I call this meeting to order. It's so great to drink wine. It tastes fantastic, and it makes you feel funny. <laughs> Didn't I ever tell you that Lurch is a genius? <laughs> you never had to tell me. He's a genius. <laughs> he manifests it every single day. Why don't we write some songs? <laughs> right what? now. Let's start. I got a notepad here. He's a writer. Oh, are you going to write writing. some lyrics? I can write things down. What I thought was that what Lurch and I... What if we were doing on the Frankenstein well, that thing that both. we were just talking about? <laughs> like the life of Frankenstein. A concept uh, album? I'm inspiration here. From, <laughs> as a whole. Hey, yeah. Perfect. You know something? <laughs> <laughs> you got a couple bolts. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> it's a miracle, really. 
though we've ever had a conversation. <laughs> Let's not start now. You know what they say about if you put a hundred monkeys in a room with typewriters that they'll eventually, you know, produce the works of Shakespeare. Who's going to clean those typewriters? <laughs> We're getting into a weird area here. Because... Monkeys, you know, <laughs> defecation. I don't know you anymore. <laughs> oh, I understand. It's like working with a this, whole new person. This relationship is... I'm so sick of you guys. <laughs> I just feel really... This was really fun. helpful for me. Yeah. This is I'm fantastic. working through something emotionally. Yeah, me too. Psychologically, and yeah. this really helped me. Yeah, and I, I quit the you. fucking stupid <laughs> band. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take your smokes and go then. <laughs> as soon as I can get over there, I'm going to rise to my knees and kick your ass. <laughs> rise to your knees. <laughs> that that sounds be, like the new Rush album that'll title. That'll be the day. <laughs> oh my god, we are genius. We're gonna do a hockey nights in hockey, Canada hockey, song hockey. with the drum solo for with the Latino yeah. stuff in it. Boy, that's gonna be one great Can't album. Wait. That's the next album, guys. We've got it sorted out. Okay, uh, I think done. we've been successful in destroying these people's film. I will remind them that I said you would regret it. You said I just that? wanted to say that. I said don't be surprised when you discover how boring we really are. Did, but I did. Cut. <laughs> now I like Rush. <laughs> the louder the better. No.